The attack on America raised so many questions. Among them, questions about the dangers of the new world economy. Is terrorism the dark side of globalization? Up until September 11th, there was a, a sense that this movement towards globalization really was irreversible. And since then, there's a recognition that things can go in another direction. Can our deeply interconnected world deliver prosperity to everyone? And that's basically the next big challenge, is, is making this interdependent world of ours, on balance, far more positive and negative. And the extent to which we succeed in doing that will determine whether the 21st century is either marred by terrorism of all kinds, or whether it becomes the most peaceful and prosperous and interesting time the world's ever known. This is the story of how the new global economy was born. The story of a century-long battle of ideas to determine who would control the commanding heights of the economy, central governments or free markets. In the 1990s, a worldwide capitalist revolution fueled the new era of globalization, the greatest expansion of world trade in history. Billions of people a day are better off than they would have been without globalization, and very few people have been harmed by it. But with the promise came a debate about the impact of globalization. Should the world's wealthiest people really dictate how the world's economy is going to run? Tonight, the battle over who should write the new rules of the game for the global economy. This program was made possible by EDS, offering business and technology solutions from strategy and implementation to hosting. EDS, managing the complexities of the digital economy. FedEx. Globality may be new to some, but to us, it's the way we do business. We're reinventing the energy business as we develop American oil and gas, next generation clean fuels, and renewables like solar power. We're the people of BP. Additional funding was provided by the Pew Charitable Trusts, the John Templeton Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Out of the sorrow of September 11th, I see opportunity chance for nations to strengthen and rethink and reinvigorate their relationships. When nations open their markets to the world, they find in America a trading partner, an investor, and a friend. We are living through a revolution. The 1990s saw the creation of a new kind of global economy. A single market in which everyone has a stake, but no one has control.
globalization has brought unprecedented prosperity. But it has also brought crises and risks we are only beginning to understand. It has unleashed a worldwide debate about wealth and poverty, about the rules of the game for this new era of globalization. Historians may well say that a new era began at the beginning of the 1990s with the end of the Cold War and the Gulf Crisis. And that was this new era of globalization, of, of, of a world being tied together by flows of investment, of trade, of ideas, of culture, of people traveling all the time. And it happened very fast, and it so often happened. The change came more quickly than the ability of thinking to catch up and understand the change. But to understand where we are today and where we're going, we have to understand this recent past. No economic idea has shaped the era of globalization more profoundly than a belief in free, open markets. Free trade has been a fundamental tenet of capitalism for over 200 years. But in the 1990s, the global market created a new reality that no government, no politician could afford to ignore. Our story begins in 1992. The global economy was changing rapidly, but America seemed adrift. A recession had left 10 million workers unemployed. Industries struggled against intense foreign competition. Europe had formed a single trading bloc. Japan looked invincible. Japanese companies were buying up American icons, like Rockefeller Center and Universal Studios. In the 1992 presidential campaign, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton claimed he could get America back on track. Have a nice day, sir. Thank you. Appreciate you. Have a nice day, Governor. I come with my vote. He drew crucial support from America's labor unions and seemed to promise workers protection against global competition. Again, look at what our competitors do. Meet the competition. Look at what the high-wage countries do. Look at what Germany does. Look at what Japan does. That's what you got to do. And you'll stand up against the good old boys to do that, huh? Absolutely. What? Good luck what, to what's you. What's the purpose of having a country if you're going to let it go down the drain? I don't know. Why have we been doing that? You got my vote. Hey, go to the get the federal employees too, okay? Thank you. Yeah, my vote. Thank you, guys. But at a meeting with Wall Street financiers, Clinton had discussed a different agenda, an agenda some of his core supporters adamantly opposed. Financial markets wanted to rein in government spending, cut the deficit, and embrace free trade. Without these policies, they thought America's economy wouldn't recover. Over dinner in an exclusive restaurant, Clinton tried to persuade some of Wall Street's most seasoned executives that he saw the world as they did. It was a small dinner in New York that I was co-hosting. We had about a dozen people. And my view was that the threshold economic issue for our country was to restore fiscal discipline after a long, long time during which fiscal discipline had eroded. I could see that uh, Reuben and the others that were there in this rather dark place where we had dinner at night were kind of looking at saying, you know, can this guy from Arkansas be president? What could, could he possibly know enough about the economy to do it? After that meeting, I thought to myself that this was a man who cared about what I at least thought we needed to care a great deal about. Now, on the issue of trade, he clearly believed in, in trade liberalization, and that clearly has been a, 
a dividing line in the Democratic Party was then is now. Trade became an issue in the 1992 presidential campaign. Republican President George Bush had negotiated a treaty that would allow unrestricted flows of trade and investment between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. For its supporters, trade embodies an idea that open markets create wealth, bind nations together, and help construct a more prosperous and a more secure world. NAFTA put that idea to a political test. In America, it was the first great debate of the globalization era. You implement that NAFTA, the Mexican Trade Agreement, where they pay people a dollar an hour, have no health care, no retirement, no pollution controls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you're going to hear a giant sucking sound of jobs being pulled out of this country. Ross right. says, with great conviction, he opposes the North American Free Trade Agreement. I am for the North American Free Trade Agreement. My problem with Governor Clinton, once again, is at one time he's going to make up his mind, he will see some merit in it, but then he sees a lot of things wrong with it. And then the other day he says he's for it. However, then we've got to pass other legislation. When you're President of the United States, you cannot have this pattern of saying, well, I'm for it, but I'm on the other side of it. I am the one who's in the middle on this. Mr. Perot says it's a bad deal. Mr. Bush says it's a hunky-dory deal. I say, on balance, it does more good than harm if, if we can get some protection for the environment so that the Mexicans have to follow their own environmental standards, their own labor law standards, and if we have a genuine commitment to re-educate and retrain the American workers who lose their jobs and reinvest in this economy. Once in office, Bill Clinton's economic policy was aimed squarely at restoring the confidence of financial markets. His first term was dominated by the battle to reduce the deficit. On trade, the president changed his position and announced he would wholeheartedly support NAFTA as it stood. Clinton gave a speech in the East Room of the White House that set out how he wanted to discuss NAFTA with the American people. It was a really quite a remarkable speech. He talked about NAFTA in a much broader context. He talked about NAFTA in the context of the rapid changes taking place in the global economy, not only from trade, but from technological development, the spread of market-based economics. This debate about NAFTA is a debate about whether we will embrace these changes and create the jobs of tomorrow, or try to resist these changes, hoping we can preserve the economic structures of yesterday. Nothing we do in this great capital can change the fact that people can move money around in the blink of an eye. I tell you, my fellow Americans, that if we learn anything from the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the governments in Eastern Europe, even a totally controlled society cannot resist the winds of change that economics and technology and information flow have imposed in this world of ours. To some of his supporters, the president's change of heart on NAFTA was nothing less than a sellout. The labor movement in the United States opposed NAFTA as it stood because we saw that as a corporate-dominated trade and investment agreement, one that served the interests of multinational corporations, that improved their flexibility, their mobility, their clout. And at the same time, NAFTA did nothing to protect the rights of workers to form unions, uh, to bargain collectively, and to really raise their voices in the political system so that workers could be a formidable countervailing power to multinational corporations. I think Clinton did sell out his traditional blue-collar supporters on the NAFTA issue, and, um, and a lot of people haven't forgiven him for that. 
our adversaries tried to make it look like the whole American establishment's on one side and the little guys are on the other. And they could, you know, stir that fear factor. And it was a tough sell. <laughs> it was a tough sell. I thought it was one of the most courageous acts of his presidency. Uh, we worked with him very hard. The Republicans in the House provided a much bigger percent of the vote than the Democrats did. Sixty percent of congressional Democrats voted against NAFTA. It passed only with Republican support. After NAFTA became law, thousands of foreign companies built factories in northern Mexico, exporting goods to the American market just a few miles away. Eighty percent of all televisions sold in the U.S. are now made here. Nearly a million workers found new jobs along the border in northern Mexico. Pues ya lo poco que me va quedando, pues yo lo voy, lo voy ahorrando para poderle mandar a mis hijos. I have two children. In the south, I didn't have a job and couldn't give my children what they need. I left them behind with relatives and came here to find work. I found a job in a television factory. I earned enough to send some money home to my children. I couldn't do that before. This is a country of about over 100 million people. And there's no question that those 10 to 12 million people who live in the north and the border area are not doing badly by Mexican standards. And it has become more industrialized with more jobs, the higher wages, better social indicators, etc. The people in the south are doing very badly by Mexican or by anybody's standards. Forty percent of Mexico's population lives in poverty. Mexico's embrace of NAFTA and free trade was part of a broader change in thinking within developing countries. Their governments increasingly saw open markets as the key to economic growth. I worked 15 years for Coca-Cola. I started as a route salesman. I started right from the bottom. And I learned that discipline, that hard working, that talent is the way to succeed. I always seen uh, globalization as an opportunity. Just the trade agreement with the United States has moved our total trading, which was six years ago, 40 billion US dollars. Today is 280 billion US dollars in just six years. Nobody loses, everybody can win. Obviously, trade has increased, investment has increased, and if the only metric you use to measure whether NAFTA has been a success or not is the volume of trade, then NAFTA is tremendously successful. And yet most normal working people, most normal citizens, don't watch the volume of trade. Companies have been more aggressive in threatening to move production to Mexico. They've succeeded in um, bargaining down wages, in opposing unions. And so on a lot of different fronts, we, th we think that NAFTA has shifted the balance of bargaining power in the continent of North America towards multinational corporations. Since NAFTA came into effect, about 400,000 American jobs have been adversely affected by trade with Canada and Mexico, according to the U.S. government. Exports to these countries have created more than a million new jobs. And over the 90s, Global trade nearly doubled. We tend to think of trade as products and goods moving across borders. In fact, the biggest trade of all can't be seen. It is money, the continuous 24-hour worldwide flow of stocks, bonds, and currencies. In the 1990s, practically anyone with savings in a pension or mutual fund became an investor in the global market. I was at a 
dinner, a so-called thinker's dinner at the White House before one of the State of the Union addresses, and there's this great discussion among all the people around the table about markets, about they out there, that it's somebody different. And finally, I raised my hand and said, with all due respect, the markets isn't just them, it's us. It's our aggregated retirement savings. It's our pension plans. That's what the markets are. The state of California runs one of America's largest pension funds. The fund, known as CalPERS, manages the retirement savings of over a million state employees. For decades, CalPERS invested only in America. But in the era of globalization, that changed. A quarter of its money was invested overseas. At one point, CalPERS controlled 5% of France's entire stock market. French television sent a crew to investigate. They were filming in my office, and I had a salad on my desk. It had been just a very hectic day. Well, they caught me, and, and we were talking about some uh, figures on my computer, but they kept filming the salad. And I got the feeling that the, you know, the story was going to be that you know, the Americans are coming, and they're going to ruin the French way of life, and we're all going to be eating salads at our desk you know, and working 12 and 14 hour days, which of course is not true at all. But I, I think it was just, there's just a fear, I think, that we've seen in the news that globalization means Americanization. Pension funds became the powerhouses of the global economy because they had the money. The real source of change in today's world, with the world getting smaller and smaller, as we say, and this, the growth of the global economy, as we say, I think it's going to be the providers of capital funds. And that, whether anybody likes it or not, increasingly are large pension funds. I have some of my own personal uh, mutual funds overseas, and um, um, they seem to be doing pretty well right now. And I think in terms of what CalPERS position is, they have a fiduciary responsibility to, to seek those markets out and to invest and to uh, uh, use that return on that investment to uh, honor their obligations. We can't keep everything in the United States. You keep things in the United States, it's still not in the United States because so many companies are global, so much, everything is global, everything is interconnected. With the end of the Cold War, many nations opened their markets to foreign investment for the first time. Funds like CalPERS saw new opportunities and hired money managers to scour the third world, now renamed Emerging Markets. OK, very good. Yeah. All right, let me talk to Dennis, huh? Yeah, but they got an election coming up. Uh -huh. Well, the whole rationale is that these emerging countries grow faster. So what we're trying to do is capture that growth and, of course, make money for our investors. But, of course, the risks are very great because there's no free lunch. So there's a balance. And, of course, it's our job to try to minimize the risk and maximize the returns. It doesn't always work out that way, but that's, that's the objective. As investment flowed around the world, the Clinton administration expanded the trade agenda it adopted with NAFTA. The U.S. encouraged developing countries to continue opening their economies to the global market. I favored a very aggressive policy. I thought that the emerging countries both emerging economically and those that were new democracies, had a better chance to do well economically and politically if the wealthier countries opened our borders and made trade agreements with them, and if in turn 
they opened their borders not only to trade but to investment. I thought that the that economic policy and traditional foreign policy would tend to merge. This is how it worked. If you go back to the first term, a lot of the international approach of the administration on economic issues was to break down barriers to uh, U.S. Um, firms. We are going to engage um, our trading partners and encourage, cajole, uh, convince them to bring down their barriers. Many developing countries had been colonies of the West. Although they now wanted long-term foreign investment, some saw fast-moving flows of money as a new threat to their independence. Once communism was defeated, then uh, capitalism can expand and show its true self. Uh, it's no longer constrained by the need to uh, be nice so that people will choose the so-called free market system as against the uh, central, centrally planned system. So because of that, now there is nothing to restrain capital. And capital is demanding that it should be able to go anywhere and uh, do whatever it likes. Some called it the triumph of capitalism. During the 1990s, more countries than ever adopted market economics. As an economics professor, Bill Christ had taught a course comparing Marxist and capitalist theories. As president of CalPERS, the California State Pension Fund, Christ came to believe that only open markets could ensure global stability. This is a kind of revolution. And uh, I think it's going to be one of the most powerful revolutions uh, over time, in my opinion, that will, that will move towards giving everyone the franchise of participation in, in, in economics. If we don't reach out to these emerging markets, if we don't be evangelists, if you will, uh, and try to encourage them to, to reform and, and invest some of our capital funds into these, these markets. If we don't do that, I'm afraid uh, that uh, some of the predictions that were made a long time ago by, by Karl Marx and uh, Mr. Ingalls and others, that there will indeed be uh, a, a confrontation between the haves and the have-nots uh, that can bring the entire system down. The very day NAFTA came into effect, the Zapatista rebels launched an uprising in southern Mexico. Shortly after, the leading presidential candidate was assassinated. Worried about stability, foreign investment began to flee. The global economy was about to face a new kind of crisis. Christmas vacation, I was fishing down in the British Virgin Islands, and Larry Summers called me, and he said, there's some problems in Mexico I'd like you to know about. And I thought to myself, that it's nice of Larry to call on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm on vacation in you know, Mexico today. It'll be some other country tomorrow, and I don't know why this can't wait till I get back. Well, it turned out that this was not just another country. It was a very, very serious matter. I was at a restaurant, and they came and said, the Secretary of the Treasury is on the line. And I got on the line, and he said, Greenspan and I have a problem. <laughs> and we believe, if we don't move very decisively, that the Mexican peso will implode. If it implodes, the Mexican government will become very unstable. And we believe you could have a wave of five to nine million people walking north to find jobs. He understood it very quickly. And I remember his saying, this is the first financial crisis of the 21st century. And I said to him, uh, this is the first 
real-time, worldwide financial crisis of a kind that will become very normal. And so I said, uh, instinctively, I'll back you. It was fascinating because we had Mexico, which we really did think was facing default, and we had enormous political problems accomplishing what we felt we needed to accomplish to support Mexico, to try to prevent this from happening. And we all knew that while we believed the program we were recommending was right, there was some risk it wouldn't work. So if you go in and say to the president, here's a big crisis that could happen. I mean, we can tell you something to do about it. We can't tell you it's going to work. It's very risky. And we know that it's extremely unpopular, but we think you should do it anyway. Somewhere between five and ten minutes, I'll listen to all this. I said, well, this is a no-brainer. We've got to do this. If we don't do this, Mexico will certainly fail. Then the borders will be flooded with illegal immigrants who are starving and need food and job. We'll have an enemy on our southern border, people that will remember when they were down and they were in need, we were not a good neighbor, and we will pay hugely for that. All over the developing world, people who look at us and think that we are smug and rich and unresponsive and don't care about anybody else will have all that confirmed. If we help, at least people will know we tried in a good cause, and it will resonate throughout the developing world. The bailout worked. Mexico paid back the loan early. For some, the intervention set a dangerous precedent, protecting big investors from risks they had willingly taken. Remember, the people that got bailed out uh, were foreign holders of Mexican government obligations. In a sense, we were trying to bail out our own citizens. Um, but it signaled to banks and other rich investors that uh, the U.S. Treasury at that time was going to um, adopt a bailout policy. People who take risks should bear those risks. If they got the reward for them, um, they should take the downside. As the Mexican crisis made clear, technology had transformed financial markets. Money could literally be moved across borders in seconds. During the 1990s, technology too leapt over national borders, spreading commerce and ideas. It's hard to believe at the beginning of the 1990s email was virtually unknown. Most people didn't have it. And a decade later, it was everywhere, and it was just become part of people's lives. And so this, uh, this communications network was so powerful. The price of telephone calls plummeted. The number of telephone calls around the world skyrocketed. And people are in contact and connected in a way that had never happened before. In two decades, the number of international phone calls from the U.S. increased from 200 million to 5.2 billion. This AT&T control center handles 300 million calls each day. Americans were often connected to the developing world without even knowing it. Consumers checking their credit card balance could be routed seamlessly to call centers like this one in India where operators identify themselves with made-up American names. Good evening, this is Tracy. How may I help you today? Okay. Just give me a moment. Right. In a remote Indian village, farmers took their crop to market as they had for generations. But an internet connection ensured they were now paid the world price for their crop, a price set at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange 8,000 miles away.
This borderless world created a new kind of business person. Entrepreneurs could now think like multinationals and see the entire world as a single market. Mariana Murti understood this revolution earlier than most. All of us believed in central planning. All of us believed in socialism because we are all children of a different generation. Then I realized uh, that if you want to eradicate poverty, you don't do it by redistribution of existing wealth. You have to create new wealth. With only $250, Murti helped found a computer software company. His headquarters in Bangalore became the world's second largest software campus. Only Microsoft's was bigger. 30% of the world's software engineers are from India. You know, I define globalization as uh, producing where it is most cost effective, selling where it is most profitable, sourcing capital from where it is cheapest without worrying about national boundaries. People, as well, were becoming increasingly mobile. America relaxed its immigration laws, attracting a huge influx of high-tech workers from across the developing world. Silicon Valley is the place, it's the happening place. So many people come here. This is a place of opportunities. We get a chance to prove ourselves. We get a chance to prove ourselves, to show our skills. In many ways, Silicon Valley was the spiritual center of the new global village, the source not only of its technology, but of its entrepreneurial ethos. The Draper family had invested in entrepreneurs since the 1950s, when they brought venture capital to Silicon Valley. In the early 90s, Bill Draper's son, Tim, funded Hotmail. Its instant global success convinced him that the world was fundamentally changing. We knew that the internet was going to change the whole way the world worked because we knew that you could do commerce, you could do uh, communication, you could do all these things over the web. And all these governments, India and Africa and Pakistan, China, were all, had all been trapped and they were not really participating in the world economy. They could now. They could because now they could communicate with the rest of the world through this internet. It was a big opportunity. And we saw it and we jumped on it. Checkmate it you again. <laughs> I think entrepreneurship can happen anywhere. Uh, all it takes is, is someone with a vision and an idea for, for how to do something better. One of the Draper's best investments was in David Lee, <laughs> the first foreign-born American to take a high-tech company public. When we came over, we have nothing. $600, 20 kilos of clothes. And this society provided, give us opportunity and everything. Even entrepreneur, it sounds very good, but uh, being a spouse is very difficult because most of the time he's traveling or he's not home. I raised my three children by myself, and uh, he doesn't re sometimes don't remember how old they are. David Lee manufactures high-end telephones. He embodies the new breed of global entrepreneur. Okay, don't eat too much, okay? <laughs> in the early 90s, David Lee returned to his homeland for the first time in over four decades. I always afraid to go back to a communist country. 
I was born in Beijing and uh, actually right in the Tiananmen Square. And uh, we left there after the revolution, 1949. We were very lucky that uh, we were able to leave the, uh, the country. We were like the boat people and on top of a, a cargo ship. We left everything, and uh, the only thing is whatever we can carry. Free tree zone, and uh, anything you do in here, you don't have to pay tariff, or uh, you can uh, you can build the thing and then ship it out, and the, for export purpose. David Lee set up a joint venture in a free trade zone near Shanghai. Lee saw at first hand a China in the midst of epic economic transformation. China's communist leadership had embraced markets and welcomed hundreds of billions of dollars of foreign investment. Almost one quarter of the world's population was entering the global market for the first time. In villages across China and throughout the developing world, people left their rural homes. They traveled to industrial towns, seeking work in new factories built to serve the global market. The era of globalization saw the largest wave of human migration in history. 80% of the world's future economic growth is expected to occur in cities rather than the countryside. I was a school teacher in the countryside. At that time, I only earned 100 a month. My parents are both farmers, so we lived a very poor life. But now I'm earning 3,000 a month. My life is totally different. My child is going to school here near the factory. So we are living a much, much better life now. China's leaders hoped to emulate the tiger economies of Southeast Asia, where trade and investment had transformed once impoverished nations. When the British came here in 1819, they found a fishing village of about 120 people. No agriculture because the ground was infertile. It's when the empires broke up. Everybody wanted to do their own trading. And uh, we could easily have just withered on the vine. So we just had to make ourselves relevant to the world and the countries that make themselves relevant become better off. Those who opt out, they suffer. Since the 1970s, the countries of Southeast Asia had become world-class exporters, shipping everything from cars to computers across the globe. And they called it the Asian Economic Miracle because the world had not really seen that kind of economic growth, that many people brought out of poverty, that rapid creation of a middle class so quickly anywhere in the history of the world. By the mid-90s, many Asian economies were growing at the astonishing rate of 10% or more each year. There was a tremendous um, confidence and hope 
that this was the ancient century and the place was being transformed and you just had to put money there and it would grow on trees. I remember the CEO of one major company in about 1995 or so saying, if we're not invested tomorrow in Asia, we're too late. Yet there was one big exception. Japan, the world's second largest economy, had fallen into a deep, unexpected slump that shook the confidence of its people. Japan was in the so-called bubble economy. And at that time, the Japanese people were not very careful about debt. After the collapse of the bubble economy, people came back to reality and came down from their dreams. Japan's economy once looked unstoppable, but it was slow to adapt to the rapid changes of a fast-moving, interconnected world. Japan is a very sort of uh, parochial and barely closed economy. There's no question about that. It's a very closed society. Uh, walk around the Japanese cities, you don't see many foreigners. Japan, the great exporter, protected its domestic industries. At the heart of the country's economic problems lay a contradiction. One sector of the Japanese economy, export-oriented uh, uh, sort of sector, which is highly competitive, uh, consisting of Toyotas and Sonys. And the other is a domestic manufacturing and domestic service industry, and which is extremely uncompetitive. You know, we have a market-oriented capitalistic system on the one hand, we have a very socialistic, uh, egalitarian sort of sector on the other hand. In Japan, government bureaucrats managed a highly regulated economy. As Masahisa Naito was to learn, ideas about change met with profound skepticism. I wanted to deregulate our financial system. The new global markets of the 1990s created a new reality. I said we had to change for Japan to thrive in the new world economy. My colleagues in the government criticized me. They said that it was in the best interest of Japan that my ideas be destroyed. Naito was fired without warning. Japan stuck to its old ways, and the nation's economic slump continued. For the first time, an Asian economic miracle was in trouble. By early 1997, Southeast Asia's rapid economic boom was overheating. Siravat Vorovet was one of many who thought the good times would never end. Ever since I was a child, I have been wanting to be multimillionaire, I wanted to be rich. I wanted to do something that no one has done, build a luxurious condominium, I knew a lot of rich people and multi-millionaires would like to take time off to play golf, to enjoy the fresh air in mountains which you cannot find in Bangkok. I looked at the golf course, it was designed by Jack Nicklaus. I put my effort to make it one of the most beautiful condominiums in in Thailand. And still today, the mountains in the background with a fairway and a lake in front of the condominium. It's really beautiful. People were just buying apartments and condominiums just like 
They, they were gambling. They were tempted by this easy money. They were tempted by this easy profit. During the 90s, Thailand had opened up its capital markets. For the first time, local businesses could borrow money from foreign banks, which offered lower interest rates. People would come and knock on your door and plead with you to borrow money, uh, be they you know, European banks or Japanese banks. They came and begged us to, to, to borrow from them. In just four years, loans to Thai businesses had tripled to over $200 billion. American and European governments encouraged the inflow of money. Oh yeah, we were strong advocates of opening up capital markets and the benefits that could flow therefrom. But we were also strong advocates at the same time, because we recognized the tie, of developing the banking systems, developing the capital markets, and developing regulatory systems, none of which is easy. And there was an underlying flaw in the system that people really didn't focus very much on, which was the institutional weakness. What that meant is that the banking systems were not well developed, the securities laws were not well developed, they were not, they had not kept up with the development of these economies and their integration into the, war, into the, into the world economy. Thailand's central bank had kept its currency artificially high, fueling the speculative bubble. The International Monetary Fund, which acts as a bank of last resort to countries in financial trouble, began to worry that Thailand was heading for a fall. I went to uh, Bangkok in May 1997. It was full of cranes everywhere and uh, it looked like the boom would never end. But there were very weak banks who were lending against the security of those buildings which were never going to be filled. Mong Tang Thani was a sign of the times, a new city built from scratch for 700,000 people. It was meant to be bigger than Boston, but almost no one was moving in. The vision was great. The vision was to take uh, this huge tract of land and build a city, basically, uh, between the downtown congested Bangkok and the airport. Uh, so the concept was, was excellent. The problem was that it was financed to a great degree by U.S. dollars. Thailand's currency, known as the baht, was pegged to the dollar. As the Thai economy weakened, Financial markets sensed this policy couldn't last. Thailand had fixed its, uh, the value of its currency in terms of dollars. It had a fixed exchange rate. And uh, as people began to wonder, well, do they actually have enough dollars to always be able to give me dollars in exchange for the baht, the Thai currency I have? And uh, when they begin to wonder about that, they start asking for the dollars. The central bank kept on saying, no, no, we will support the currency at this fixed rate. And of course, they were shelling out the US dollars uh, to protect the currency. So their foreign reserves were dwindling. And of course, any hedge fund manager looking at that would say, hey, these guys are going to be in trouble, and I'm going to short the Thai baht. The baht came under relentless market pressure. In July 1997, the Thai government was forced to devalue. The bubble had burst. The Asian financial crisis was about to begin. Okay, here we are. When it hit, I realized my uh, fate. I could not sell a single unit when the crisis hit. And this was my most expensive model unit. Now no more doors, all decorations, materials gone. My condominium is called uh, American Dream Kitchen. Home Dream Condominium. But we are broke. Even my clients who were multi-billionaire broke also.
the economic shock reverberated through all levels of Thai society. When the economy went bad, my husband's salary was cut 30%. I was lucky, I kept my job, but I didn't get a rest. To support our family, my husband had to find other work. Every morning, he drives a motorcycle taxi. The cost of living was rising. Everything was going up. Water, electricity, even so. But the salaries were staying the same, or even going down. With its economy in a virtual freefall, Thailand received an emergency rescue loan from the International Monetary Fund. When that didn't work, the Thai government asked Washington for even more help. No one imagined that an economy as small as Thailand's could spark a global crisis. Thailand is a very small economy. It doesn't have a lot of links. And it's not exactly in your backyard. In any event, the U.S. Uh, chose not to intervene in Thailand, thinking it was not going to spill over. Why would it? Uh, why, the contagion effects were not apparent to anybody, not just the administration. I think they misjudged the situation. They misjudged the situation. And uh, probably because it was seen too much as a financial issue rather than an overall strategic issue. Global markets worried that other Asian countries might have similar hidden flaws. Like a classic run on the bank, money began to pull out of the entire region. They called it contagion. And at each stage, the crisis uh, turned out to have a virulence which became known as contagion, much greater than it had been anticipated. And what that really reflected was indeed globalization, was the way these economies had become locked together and investors looked at emerging markets. They said there's a problem in Thailand, well then there's a problem in these other countries. And so each, each, each step of the crisis created these shock waves that carried on into the next. Contagion spread to Thailand's neighbors. Malaysia's economy had seemed stable. Suddenly, it too was facing relentless pressure from global markets. We have the uh, currency going down and down and down, and we have the stock market doing the same. And we felt totally helpless. Uh, we feel that uh, there is no way we can, uh, we can recover. So, I mean, the feeling is really very bad, very frightening. Contagion next hit Indonesia, the most populous country in the region. Its government collapsed. Its cities descended into chaos. The fund managers did know the difference between Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore. They just say, I want out. Property prices collapse, companies collapse. And in the case of Indonesia, the social fabric collapsed. Churches have been burned, mosques have been attacked. They have killed each other. And it's all the fallout of an economic collapse. This was a new kind of financial crisis, unlike anything the International Monetary Fund had ever encountered. The IMF organized huge loans for Indonesia and other Asian nations, on the condition they cut government spending, raise interest rates, and eliminate corruption. You are the doctor going in to deal with a very sick patient. The public blames the doctor for the fact that the patient is sick, but the patient was sick to begin with. But these things are societally wrenching, and there are huge vested interests. And you wouldn't get into these crises if the vested interests weren't that important. 
That, I think, is one of the reasons why it takes political change to deal with a crisis as big as this. To some of the region's entrenched leaders, the IMF's conditions smacked of a new kind of colonialism. Presently, we see a well-planned effort to undermine the economies of all the ASEAN countries by destabilizing their currencies. In the old days, you need to conquer a country with military force, and then you can control that country. Today, it is not necessary at all. You can uh, destabilize a country, make it poor, and then make it uh, a request for help. And for the help that is given, you gain control over the policies of a country. And when you gain control over the policies of a country, effectively, you have colonized that country. The market forces were simply too powerful for the IMF or any government to contain. In late 1997, contagion reached Korea, one of the most successful economies in the world. It was uh, unbelievable uh, that the crisis uh, has spread as quickly as uh, uh, to Indonesia and Korea uh, within a matter of six months or seven months. But the uh, world was much more globalized than we thought uh, it was at that time. In the last week of December of 1997, the 11th largest country, economy rather, in the world, which is Korea, had roughly speaking four billion of reserves left and was using reserves at the rate of one billion dollars a day. Well, it didn't take a great deal of quantitative insight to see that that was not a long-term viable situation. Korea had been misleading the world, claiming it had enough money to withstand the crisis. The IMF's Stanley Fisher arrived in Seoul to inspect the central bank's accounts. I visited Korea a couple of days before they uh, turned to the IMF for help. And there was a state of panic. And it was at that point that uh, I went to the central bank and was shown how much money was left in the Korean central bank. It was essentially all gone. Korea was about to default on its loans from Japanese and Western banks. Pressured by their governments, the banks agreed to share some of the pain. They rolled over their loans. Korea was then given the largest bailout in history. If they had done that in Thailand, I think that uh, they would have not only avoided some economic problems, but I think that the sense in Southeast Asia that the Americans uh, were really on the side of putting things right, would have been stronger. Then a very, very strange thing happened. From about the 1st of February, 1998, until August, there was a period in which financial markets essentially decided that risk didn't exist anywhere. Markets thought contagion had been contained in Asia. Investment flowed elsewhere. Some came to Russia, where the Moscow stock market was the best performing in the world. But economic reforms had stalled, and Russia was heavily in debt. Even so, investors were convinced they'd found an emerging market that couldn't fail. Investors had decided Russia is an ex-superpower. It has lots of missiles and lots of atomic warheads for them, certainly you could not have a financial accident in Russia because the rest of the world, the rich countries, would bail Russia out. Well, it turned out that that was wrong. Russia defaulted on its debt. Its currency plummeted. Global investors were stunned. All these people who in the previous seven months had decided there was no risk anywhere literally panicked and decided there's got to be massive risk everywhere. Behind each fence and barnyard wall, there must be a risk that we hadn't thought of, kind of like the Redcoats re retreating from Lexington. 
Everywhere, markets were freezing up. The economic crisis seemed to have taken on a life of its own. I thought at the time that I had a pretty good sense of what was going on, but what I didn't know, and nobody could possibly have known, was not what was going on at the moment that you were looking at, but what was going to happen at the next moment. Well, when you get in a room with both Alan Greenspan and Robert Rubin, and they say they're scared to death, and they've never seen anything like this, and they're worried about whether or not we can get through it, I get worried, because they know a heck of a lot more about it than I do. You had the contagion sweeping across all the developing countries. As Rubin said, we've never seen that before. I mean, maybe in the Depression they saw that over a period of time, but nothing that happened that quickly. Now the crisis had reached America. A little known but powerful private investment fund was on the brink of bankruptcy. Long-term capital management, or LTCM, directly controlled $100 billion of global assets and indirectly more than a trillion dollars. The 90s saw a huge buildup in concentrations that we had never seen uh, on a global scale. Maybe we had way back in history, maybe the Romans had financial institutions that were uh, disproportionately large to the overall activity of the world that they operated in, but LTCM was a specific uh, type of hedge fund. They were involved, whether it was the Singapore Exchange, the uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, the New York, what, you know, there was no market that they weren't maybe the largest player or close to the largest player. By September 1998, LTCM's losses were spiraling out of control. Contagion had arrived on Wall Street. Incredibly, the failure of this single investment fund threatened the entire global economy. If LTCM went down, it would be just the gears, the machine just stopping, the economy not working. And of course, it's not just what's on the balance sheet of banks and so forth, but that would translate into people not working, businesses not operating, small businesses not being able to get the capital they, they need, and this, uh, uh, an ec a global economy that almost inconceivable to see what the picture, but sort of just not working, and people just not working. The New York Federal Reserve summoned representatives of major U.S. and European banks to an urgent meeting. John Corzine, then at Goldman Sachs, was among them. The real problem with long-term capital was nobody really understood all the downsides. All one knew was it was going to be extraordinarily uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, to enter into that. And everybody, I think, understood the Fed's concern that that had real implications to the real economy. Since LTCM was a private fund, the government could not impose a solution. The fate of the global economy was in the hands of these bankers. The head of a securities firm or a bank is not paid to be a patriot. He or she is paid to serve the best interests of the shareholders. So the most that one can do in a position like mine is to say the public interest may well be served by long-term capital management not failing. But there is no public sector money to solve the problem. The taxpayer is not going to do this. You folks have to decide wh whether it's in your interest to do it. The banks agreed to put up their own money to rescue LTCM. Wall Street had averted disaster, but the global crisis had one final chapter to go. What had started in Asia now reached Brazil, the eighth largest economy in the world. But this time, a loan package was put in place early. 
Brazil's government cut spending and enacted reforms. It worked. Brazil's problems were contained. Global financial markets gradually returned to normal. It's not clear when you would say it ended, but what happened was that the countries that actually took ownership of reform, Korea, Thailand, Brazil, began to reestablish stability in their financial markets and their economies started to recover. And after a while, there came a point we began to feel maybe we're past the crisis. Then a little bit past that, we said, you know, it does look like we are past the crisis. And finally, we got to the point where we said, well, we think this is over. The world economy had survived the first crisis of the globalization era. But millions of ordinary people had paid the price. And that's the unfortunate part of so-called globalization, because such negative effects can come very fast. It takes decades for a country to grow up, and all of a sudden it disappears. We have been a poor country, so we never tested richness. When we tested the richness, we wanted more. Being greedy, I blame myself also. Never had enough. Quite a view. Yeah, it's quite a view. And uh, I really feel bad because no one can enjoy it now. It's all left to the bank. And here I see a nice fairway, a nice lake. It's so sad. Sandwich, my cup. Silly what sandwich, my cup. Silly what sandwich, my cup. Silly cup. Silly what sandwich, my cup. I had a big dream. I couldn't achieve it. And that's why I'm today standing selling things for two hours and you don't sell anything or you sell very seldom sell. But after four years of struggling, at least I know I have a chance. Today, my big dream is to be McDonald's of Thailand. Because uh, selling sandwiches on the streets, now I develop a new uh, Japanese sushi. I use Thai brown rice. I'm the first in Thailand. So hopefully in the near future, I will raise my funds in the local stock market. So in the near future, I will be McDonald's of Thailand. The global economy rested on institutions that dated back to the end of the Second World War. The contagion crisis proved that the new era of globalization needed new rules. We have to improve the rules of the game. You want the financial system essentially to be like the shock absorber in a car. When you hit a pothole, yes, this car still bounces. But have you ever been in one that didn't have a shock absorber? If you have a good, strong shock absorber, at least you get through the pothole and you're still driving in the same direction that you thought you were when you hit it. The moral is that there are risks to globalization, but in the end, there's no alternative to globalization. So don't let your banks go lend recklessly. Don't allow bubbles to get out of hand. Keep prudent measures, sound economic policies which will inspire confidence and maintain confidence so in a crisis people will know that you will stay the course and won't panic and be up and off. It's easier said than done, but these are the principles you have to follow. We had a close call and without an activist international policy, you could have seen a uh, perhaps as serious an economic downturn as we'd seen any time since the Great Depression. And that's why we need to continue to understand the dynamics of financial crisis better. And that's why especially the United States needs to be prepared to take a lead in working to contain financial crises. For many Americans, the world financial crisis created new unease about the risks of the global economy. People 
sense the instability of it. They get indicators like big meltdowns, like the financial crisis in Asia. But they also get indicators of, of things like, you know, the local bank, which just keeps getting merged and renamed, like your card does work and then it doesn't work and the name keeps changing every three weeks. And you combine that with the real financial cataclysms like the Asian meltdown, and a lot of people in their everyday life are seeing this sort of out of control scenario very personally. You know, it's out of their personal control. For critics like Lori Wallach, this was an opportunity. Together with allies in labor unions, they began to channel public anxiety into what became known as the anti-globalization movement. The World Trade Organization, known as the WTO, manages the rules that govern global trade. In late 1999, Delegates from 135 nations gathered in Seattle. They planned to launch a new round of negotiations that would expand trade even further. Instead, Seattle was a watershed. As one could see from the way Seattle exploded, it really caught the people at the World Trade Organization meeting there quite by surprise largest environmental organization in the world with offices of more than take six us away, but they cannot silence us. And it became a lightning rod for all of those people across this very broad spectrum who are concerned by some aspect of globalization or what they perceive as globalization or by the causes that animate and move them. And yet the WTO, which is led by CEOs of the company that make bovine growth hormone, get to make rules saying that these countries can't ban an unsafe product. While the protesters represented an array of interest groups, the majority were from American labor unions, which had bust in thousands of their members. People came together from all over the world in Seattle to say that the rules of the current global economy, as embodied in the World Trade Organization, are unfair, they're bad for developing countries, they're bad for workers, and they're bad for the environment. In the 1990s, the expanding U.S. economy created 17 million new jobs. But union share of the workforce had fallen dramatically. The AFL-CIO blamed cheap labor overseas. As an example, they pointed to this factory in China, where workers are paid $5 a day to make bicycles once built in America. Our workers are in direct competition with workers overseas. We can't control whether every single job stays in the United States or not. But it's another thing to lose jobs to workers who are being denied their fundamental human rights, who are not represented by independent trade unions. And so that changes the nature of competition that American workers face. Countries that opened their markets saw their overall wealth and living standards increase. Yet the politics of trade were less straightforward than the economics. It's always difficult to sell uh, open markets. There's a basic problem that the costs of open markets, whether it's somebody losing a job particularly, are very obvious. The benefits are much less clear. Whoever uh, said on Christmas Day, gosh, thanks, without open markets, I would have only been able to buy half as many toys for my kid. On the other hand, every job loss that can remotely be connected to international trade, people do. So this problem of invisible beneficiaries and very, benefic very um, visible losers is one that bedevils the political economy of trade. The truth is that the business community has very good access to the international institutions and to their own governments. And we hit the streets because we feel that we have a harder time getting our governments to listen or that our governments are unresponsive to the concerns that we've raised. And we think we can do better. We think we could write a set of rules for the global economy that would ensure that corporations had to live up to a minimum standard. But inside the Seattle meeting, 
the union's demands met stiff resistance from the developing world. They wanted more trade, not less. Poorer countries charged that America and Europe unfairly protect industries with powerful union and business support. Let's take textile trade. Now, all textile imports into America, for example, are governed by quotas. Every country is allocated a certain quota. It's not free trade. It's managed trade. America is free to sell textiles to us, but we are not free to sell textiles to America. Developing countries forged a negotiating bloc to make Western markets more open. This should not be uh, a time when big countries, strong countries, the world's wealthiest countries, are setting about a process designed to enrich themselves. Bill Clinton had been a leading proponent of expanded trade. But the protests forced him into a political corner. A presidential election was about to begin, and Democrats needed union support. In a speech to WTO delegates, Clinton appeared to side with the protesters on the streets. I condemn the small number who were violent and who tried to prevent you from meeting. But I'm glad the others showed up because they represent millions of people who are now asking questions about whether this enterprise, in fact, will take us all where we want to go. I think his speech at Seattle was an absolute disgrace and, a, and a, an act of strategic defeat for him. Let me offer... I think they were gearing up for the election and, and appeasing the unions to elect Gore was more important than standing for free trade. Clinton instructed American WTO negotiators to keep protections for key U.S. industries. The summit ended in failure. Leaders across the developing world vowed to block the next round of trade negotiations unless their demands were taken seriously. We believe in trade, but we didn't believe in just being a market for other people. So when you talk about opening markets, you're talking about the rich people who can, who can manufacture goods with added value and selling it in, in, the, in our markets, not the other way around. Countries like Tanzania that rely on foreign aid claim they wouldn't need the aid if they could only sell their products to the West. We talk about a level playing field, but in fact it is very much tilted in their favor. We would earn so much more than we are possibly getting by bilateral aid if, if, we are just, if those markets were just open to us, literally by billions. Global poverty soon became the galvanizing issue among globalization's opponents. In the wake of Seattle, control of the protest movement began to shift from unions to a disparate network of grassroots activists. We're trying to move from the politics of protest to the politics of liberation. It's not simply trying to create a kinder, gentler kind of capitalism, you know? It's not simply about trying to have social clauses that or negotiate the terms of our misery, you know, try to make our misery a little bit less miserable. It's about changing the world. It's about creating structures and institutions and frameworks and communities and neighborhoods that are based on our values, which are values of social justice, of mutual aid, of solidarity, of direct democracy. And we're a long way from where we want to go, but we have to start now. One of the protesters' next targets was the World Bank, an institution whose sole purpose is to reduce poverty in developing countries. When you see someone outside a barricade attacking you vehemently because of something called globalization, you have to wonder what it is they're getting at. Excuse me, sir. So it enrages me when you have people who assume that they have the moral high ground against a team of people here 
who are devoting their lives to addressing the very questions that these people claim to be addressing. But the protests had become impossible to ignore. Inside the World Bank and other institutions, officials struggled to make sense of the growing debate. The protest movement is multifaceted and the anger is multifaceted, but there clearly is a sense of, of losing control and a sense of alienation. The old structures and the old institutions and the, and the old lines aren't working anymore. And I think we're at a stage where there is this extraordinary chaos in international organizations, in international rules of the game that we're trying to define. And we're not there yet. And I think like any chaotic situation, when you're in the middle of it, you don't see the way out. But I think what we're, what we're observing, the series of, of protests, the series of engagements, is part of the process of coming towards some new structure for managing a global economy. Globalization did not cause global poverty, but it did make us more aware of it. And by creating a single global market, it raised the question of how that market benefits the world's poorest nations. We are seeing around the world a movement towards greater reliance on markets, greater confidence in markets. But for that confidence to last, it has to be seen that these markets are fair, that they are delivering the benefits widely, that, that people are, are, are benefiting from them. And if they don't have that kind of legitimacy, then the confidence is not going to remain and the markets will be vulnerable to disruption and being replaced by other kinds of controls. So every day uh, the market has to uh, earn and prove its legitimacy. And that's uh, a big test, particularly in the developing world, where the number one issue is the issue of poverty. And that, more than anything else, is what these markets will be judged by. The world is more unequal than at any time in world history. Uh, there's a basic reason for that, which is that 200 years ago, everybody was poor. A relatively small part of the world achieved what economists call modern economic growth. But those countries represent only about one-sixth of humanity, and five-sixths of humanity is what we call the developing world. Uh, it's the vast majority of the world. Uh, the gap can be 100 to 1 uh, in some cases, maybe a gap of $30,000 per person, uh, and $300 per person. That's absolutely astounding to be on the same planet and to have uh, that uh, extreme uh, variation in uh, material well-being. The problem that, that's happened over these last years is that somehow or other people who are capitalists in countries like the United States consider that the real interlocutors are rich people from developing countries. So they've been touching the wrong constituency. The constituency of capitalism has always been poor people that are outside the system. Capitalism is essentially a tool for poor people to prosper. Hernando de Soto is one of the most original economists in the developing world. An advisor to Mexico, Peru, Egypt, and other countries, he seeks to cut through the old debate about wealth and poverty and reinvent capitalism in the name of the poor. Fernando de Soto has been called the most important economist in the third world. He's a champion of market economics and property rights in Latin America. His new book, The Mystery of Capital, he talks about the question of why capitalism triumphs in the West and fails everywhere else. Welcome. The important thing about a capitalist system is that it's a system of representations. When I go to the United States, people ask me for my identity, and I say, my identity is me. I mean, look at my face. I am Hernando de Soto. But the man at U.S. Immigration just says, look, give me your passport. The reason 
that things travel so well in the market economy of the United States and values travel from one place to another is because they all have passports. And real value is like my identity. It's not in me. It's in my passport. Real value to pay the hotel room is not in me. It's in the credit card. And so what happens is that this system by representation it requires, of course, that all these representations, the credit cards, the passports, the IDs, the property titles, and the shares be organized by a system of law that allows people to be able to trust what they're dealing with. In September 2000, De Soto published his explanation of why capitalism hasn't worked for the poor. He took his message directly to some of Latin America's most remote regions. The reason I'm going to Cajamarca now is because 12 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall and 11 years after Peru adopted pro-market policies, their situation hasn't gotten that much better. And they want to know why. The mystery of capital offers an explanation. It says that the system per se works in the West but that in our country, like in much of the third world, it isn't functioning because we have missed some of the crucial elements that the Westerners had in the 18th and 19th century, like property rights, without which the system cannot function. De Soto's book had become the number one bestseller in Peru's history. El sistema legal no solamente es útil para vincularnos en el Perú, ya no podemos en el Perú, entonces no en el Perú, sino en And in poor neighborhoods across the country, this economist had become a celebrity. De Soto believes that people are capitalists by nature, but that in the developing world, most are locked out of the capitalist system. Peru, like in every other developing and former communist nations, people on the ground, with or without a property law, have basically agreed on the distribution of assets among themselves. You go to any of the places we've been to, uh, the hinterland of, uh, of Egypt, of uh, the Philippines, uh, of Haiti, where there is no official law that is actually in place or being enforced, but there is another law in place. You step on somebody's territory and somebody comes up and says, get off my territory, whether there's a law or no law. You walk down a street and you walk into a garden and some, the dog starts barking and you start finding out that that dog is defending a consensually agreed determination of possession rights throughout a certain area. So there are property systems in place. The question, the, thing, the important thing is that they're illegal. They're extra legal, to be more precise. In the West, property rights are taken so for granted, they rarely cross our minds. But in many countries, these crucial tools of capitalism simply aren't available. In the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro, Philip Tesha's family has grown coffee for generations. He sells directly into the global market. Yet like many in the developing world, he can't prove that what he owns is actually his. Who owns the land around here? The land is our property. We bought it for, from, the, from a, a farmer who were, we, was willing to sell to us. So we bought this land, although we don't hold any title for, 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 the, for the ownership, but it's our property. So how can you prove that it's your property? Uh, because I'm here. I was the person who bought it, and the person who sold it to me is also around here. So what we've been discovering is that there's a real huge paper wall that stops the poor from actually being able to develop a private legal enterprise. Yes, 
Without property rights, ordinary people in developing countries can't get a loan, a mortgage, or credit. They are excluded from the capitalist system, and the global market simply passes them by. So this is a time of crisis for the cause of capitalism worldwide, because for the moment, it is only meant giving the elites of developing countries additional opportunities and not being able to get down deep, deep into where the real majority interests of people in any developing country are, which is among the poor. It is uh, an incredible moral problem how to live uh, together with this uh, vast gap uh, in, in wealth. Uh, it's also an incredible intellectual problem. It's what uh, development economists such as myself uh, spend uh, all our time thinking about. Why is the gap so large? Uh, what can be done to uh, help the poorer countries narrow the gap? It's a very tough question. Places like Marilani in northern Tanzania are the bottom end of the global economy. Miners hunt for gemstones, tanzanite, that will eventually sell for over $1,000 per stone. Some mines are too narrow for grown men to navigate. Those mines are left to children as young as 10, known as snake kids. For each stone, they receive less than one dollar. Oliver Twist has come to town, and he's poor, and he's got a TV set, and he's able to see how you live. As compared to how he lives, he's going to get very angry. So either you show him a capitalist route to do it and integrate him, or he's going to find another ideology. And the fact that today there is no more a Kremlin that is organizing revolt doesn't mean that they're not going to find another capital. Because when these things happen, when people are unhappy and rebel against the system, they'll find another locus of power very, very quickly. I'm not one of these people that believes that economics solves all problems. But if people know they're taking care of their children, and if they have a, a, a personal interest in maintaining the peace, it's just easier for them to manage life's difficulties. You know, it's no accident that the Nazi party arose in Germany. Everybody who was alive at the time remembers people in the Weimar Republic after the harsh peace of Versailles after World War I, carrying wheelbarrows full of worthless marks to the bakery to buy a loaf of bread. So I, I, I don't want to oversell this. It is not sufficient to build a peaceful, free world, but it is absolutely necessary. What is Trade. In his final foreign policy address before leaving office, Bill Clinton sought to define the challenges of globalization. He had come to the presidency saying that free trade would benefit America. He left arguing it was crucial to maintaining the peace in an interconnected world. First, let me say, I think it's quite important that we unapologetically reaffirm a conviction that open markets and rule-based trade are necessary proven engines of economic growth. Now, I know that many people don't believe that. And I know that inequality, as I said, in the last few years has increased in many nations. But the answer is not to abandon the path of expanded trade, but instead to do whatever is necessary to build a new consensus on trade. <laughs> That's easy for me to say. You can see how successful I was in Seattle and doing that. No generation has ever had the opportunity that all of us now have to build a global economy that leaves no one behind. 
For eight years, I have done what I could to lead my country down that path. I think for the rest of our lives, we had all better stay on it. Thank you very much. Washington's free trade agenda passed seamlessly from the Clinton to the Bush administration. Conquering poverty creates new customers. What some call globalization is in fact the triumph of human liberty stretching across national borders. And it holds the promise of delivering billions of the world's citizens from disease and hunger and want. At this stage, I don't find uh, in my travels around the country or even around the world that there is a widespread opposition to the basic fundamental trends that have been there for the last 40 or 50 years. Millions of people today are better off than they would have been without those trends and developments, without globalization, without the developments of uh, increased international commerce. And uh, that's all to the good, and very few people have been harmed by it. On his first foreign trip, President Bush came to Mexico. His friend Vicente Fox wanted to use the global market to relieve his nation's endemic poverty. Mexico has been one of the losers of the 20th century. We tried many different alternatives to uh, development, and unfortunately, we have 40% of the population poor. We have a per capita income that is extremely low. Uh, it is the same per capita income we had 25 years ago. So we must change things. Presidents Bush and Fox hoped to expand the North American Free Trade Agreement to the entire Western Hemisphere. Now we want to go further. I'm talking about uh, a NAFTA plus a NAFTA that takes us to a further integration. I've been talking this with President Bush, and fortunately, he's seeing it the same way. But as his foreign minister, Fox chose a leading voice of the left, a one-time friend of Fidel Castro and critic of global capitalism. The left's main issue since uh, the middle of the 19th century has been the inequality that accompanies capitalism. There is probably more inequality pressing against society today than before within rich countries, within poor countries, and between rich countries and poor countries. So on this score, for example, uh, the left has more of a cause or of a raison d'etre uh, than perhaps uh, any time recently. Presidents Fox and Bush were set to meet again in Quebec City at a summit for 34 democratically elected presidents from North and South America. The National Assembly is over there, so um, the mentality was we have to surround our National Assembly with symbols of modernity. Anti-globalization like activists very, made the summit their next target. Whatever people say, there will be some sort of property destruction or some sort of violence. And we need to look at the effectiveness of things that we are doing. Mm -hmm. The way that the division has played out is very abstract, violence, nonviolence. And for me, that's not, the, that, that's not the way the debate should be played out. Our goal is to disrupt the summit as best we can with the largest possible mobilization on the 20th and the 20, 21st. The summit's agenda was to be trade, poverty, and the new rules of the game. Organizers sealed off the city center. As President Bush and other leaders arrived, the demonstrators tried to break through.
inside the barricades, Mexico's foreign minister was now a part of the system he'd once criticized. They never mentioned the Americans. They said, we need leeway with, to show that we can get results. This is my first big summit as foreign minister. And it's fun. I um, get to see a lot of people who are very uh, representative of their societies and the power elites in their countries, and also friends. So, so everybody's here. If you were 25 today, where would you be? In the streets. I would think that's certainly a hell of a lot more fun. Like Jorge Castaneda, most of the delegates were from developing countries that had embraced globalization. Castaneda wanted more trade. He also hoped to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor of the developing world. An issue that's been coming up constantly in the speeches, that you know, the small countries, the poorer sectors of each society, need a special deal, that they cannot just be left out, because if they are, they'll never be brought in. There is, I would say, a growing consensus on that, but there isn't necessarily a consensus on what to do. I'm here to learn and to listen from voices to those inside this hall and to those outside this hall who want to join us in constructive dialogue. By now, the street demonstrations had become a routine feature of major international meetings. Protest organizers were increasingly sophisticated, using the internet and other tools of globalization to try to bring the system down. To put out a general call for protesters to come down to quote the Abraham. It seems like there is a scuffle with the police. We need some reinforcements. Um, we need some super protest power. So we travel around the country and we set up these web streams. Wherever there's a minor or major demonstration, wherever people want this to be set up, we'll help them. And so if we can provide alternatives, if we can provide um, criticisms that come from the streets and represent a diversity of people, then I think there's, there's a possibility of success. And that success would be, you know, burning the free trade area, the Americas. That success would be disbanding the WTO. That success would be removing the power from the top 1% of the world's population. The protesters, by staking out an extremist position, make a more regulatory position more centrist. And that's fine. Perhaps that, that, that's not what they want, but that's too bad. <laughs> you don't always get what you want, and you don't always know who you're working for. But I do think that the protesters are natural allies of people who believe that there are things that should be done to manage world trade in a certain way. The lasting impact of the protest movement was subtle but real. Since Seattle, the terms of the global debate had shifted. When the first protest started, I remember feeling very frustrated because they had no alternative program. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, and if one looks historically, the role of protest movements isn't to provide solutions. It's their job to be critical. And then it's the job of the insiders, the people in the system, in their response to those protests to come up with new solutions. Um, and I think that's where we're at now. So I've, I do think it's healthy that we have them you know, banging at the gates. I would say this, they care about legitimate problems, but they have the wrong diagnosis. Their diagnosis is that the global economy has produced all the misery that they're protesting against. On the other hand, you cannot have a global economy without a global social response, without a global environmental response, without a global security response. It's just, it's unrealistic to think you can. And that's basically the next big challenge, is, is making this interdependent world of ours on balance far more positive and negative. And the extent to which we succeed in doing that will determine whether the 21st century uh, is either marred in its first 50 years by terrorism of all kinds across natural borders 
and more racial and religious and ethnic strife and tribal strife in Africa or whether it becomes the most peaceful and prosperous and interesting time the world's ever known. In the first decade of the 20th century, the global economy was in many ways as integrated as ours today. That era of globalization ended in Sarajevo in 1914, when a bullet fired by a terrorist triggered the First World War. In the aftermath of September 11th, it seemed possible that history could repeat itself. Up until September 11th, there was a, a sense that with the crises and the risks, that nevertheless, this movement towards globalization really was irreversible. And since then, there's a recognition uh, that things can go in another direction. Uh, markets do best and work best and deliver what they can do during times of peace. And if you're not in a time of peace, but you're in some other kind of time, uh, then uh, things won't work as well and priorities will be elsewhere as well. The U.S. economy was already in recession. As the war against terrorism progressed, the Bush administration sought to rebuild economic confidence. Out of the sorrow of September 11, I see opportunity. A chance for nations to strengthen and rethink and reinvigorate their relationships. When nations open their markets to the world, they find in America a trading partner, an investor, and a friend. In November 2001, the World Trade Organization gathered as planned in the Middle East. The remote city of Doha had been chosen to keep protesters away, but September 11 had dampened the anti-globalization movement. Delegates reached the compromise that had eluded them in Seattle. A new round of trade negotiations was launched, and the concerns of the developing world will be at the top of the agenda. I think that the new technologies, the, the breaking down of trade and capital market barriers, the spread of market-based economics, that all of this ha has contributed greatly to, to global economic well-being and contribute enormously for, for a long, long time to come. I think the potential is tremendous. But the people in those countries who feel that they are left out and the system isn't working for them have merit on their side of the case. And I think it's not only an issue of being helpful to them, I think it's enormously in our interest that they become part of the system. I don't think there's any one overnight solution. I don't know anybody who's smart enough to sit down and write a brand new set of rules that uh, we should all then adhere to. I think it is a process of negotiation among uh, sovereign and independent nations. And that's probably as it should be. Uh, and it will evolve over time. And uh, I do think we learn from our mistakes. But I, uh, the idea that, that uh, there's some sort of basic right way to do it out there and there's one individual or group who've got all the answers, uh, I'd be deeply suspicious of that notion. Months later, the American economy seemed on the road to recovery. While threats remained, the global system seemed more robust than many had feared. The era of globalization looks set to continue, as does the debate over the new rules of the global game. The belief that trade increases the odds for peace uh, and also leads to higher standards of living is something that has been part of the American political tradition. And uh, looking back on the Depression, looking back on the First and Second World, World War, it became very deep-seated. And it's not a question of specific trade agreements, but it's really a broad consensus about the importance of trade to the American economy, to what it does for economic development around the world, and also as one of the foundations for a more peaceful world. Watch all of Commanding Heights online at pbs.org. This enhanced netcast links to an interactive time map, country reports, economic data, and important full-length interviews about the future world economy. Commanding Heights video set and book are available from WGBH Boston Video. 
To place an order, please call 1-800-255-9424. This program was made possible by EDS, offering business and technology solutions from strategy and implementation to hosting. EDS, managing the complexities of the digital economy. FedEx. Globality may be new to some, but to us, it's the way we do business. We're reinventing the energy business as we develop American oil and gas, next generation clean fuels, and renewables like solar power. We're the people of BP. Additional funding was provided by the Pew Charitable Trusts, the John Templeton Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS.